All right. Uh, we will wait another couple of minutes, I think, Claire, because uh, people are trickling in, and this room is not a usual one, so people will probably work to find it a little bit. I was about to suggest the same. I can't see too many people arriving just yet. Okay, I think um, if we kick off, we've got quite a few people attending remotely, so um, fairly good attendance so far. Uh, so welcome to uh, Working Group SATP. Um, thank you to those that have been before and welcome to those that haven't been already. Um, please participate as, as much as possible. Uh, a brief note well introduction. I hope everyone can see that clearly. Um, just a reminder of the IT policies that are in place. Um, that make sure that we're all following the correct policies and, and processes. Uh, Wes is, is our resident expert on those, so I'm sure he will remind us if anyone needs it. Um, again, with the, the note well. If anyone's got any questions about the note well or policies and procedures before we get cracking now, it's probably a good time to start. Um, remember of the code of conduct, we treat each other with respect. We speak slowly and try and avoid the use of slang. Um, we use reasoned argument and logic to dispute ideas. Um, we use our best judgment. Uh, we look for the best solution, um, especially in our case where we are network agnostic uh, for the whole internet. And we contribute to the ongoing work, work of the group. Um, a reminder again, the session is being recorded. Uh, there will be minutes and notes um, ready to circulate after the event as well. Um, but just be aware that you are being recorded. Um, again, links to the, the working group information and the drafts, which I'm hoping most, if not all of you, have, have done a pre-read. This is, is not to, to discuss the, the pre-reads, um, so we're expecting everyone to come with a fairly good knowledge of the drafts already there. Um, and a brief reminder of our scope. Um, so, fairly new working group in, with, with all things being considered. We have three internet drafts um, that either answer the problem solved here in the yellow or support or, or, or give further definition of the potential use cases. Um, so that's just a brief reminder that it's a one-way transfer of any digital asset to be defined 
um, between networks. It's agnostic to both the technology of the networks and to the nature of the asset. So it is the communication between two what we've coined gateways, um, not the gateways themselves, nor the networks themselves, um, which we will obviously go through in more detail. Um, Thomas, I think, is, is going to be speaking on the, on the current draft agenda and the architecture. Uh, speaking of the agenda, what have we got lined up for you today? Um, this introduction and the process reminders, which we've just done, moving into uh, swiftly on to uh, Thomas, who's going to review the SATP architecture draft. Um, Raphael's got an update for us on the recovery draft and the Rust implementation. Uh, we have uh, a speaker demoing, um, sorry, Victor, who's going to be demoing the NFT use cases. Um, we're going to have a report from the um, network identification design team um, who've been running, um, I think, bi-weekly on the side. So thank you very much for all of your hard work. Um, and then Dennis is going to, to bring his work on the asset profile definition. And then, as always, um, any other business. If people have suggestions for any other business, if you can pop it in the chat, um, we'll make sure things are prioritised and covered as, as needed. So without further ado, um, or before I kick off any further and hand over to Thomas, has anyone got any questions or comments they'd like to make at the start? Actually, Claire, we do need to find a note taker. Is there anybody that willing to That was going to be the next thing I said before. Okay, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So can I have a volunteer for a note taker, please? Wes, does anyone in the attendee list look like a handy little note taker? what you can see i'm staring at a room full of downturned faces which are really good for you know people <laughs> they, uh, there was even a joke about that at last night's becca kucha oh brilliant yeah so are you able to take notes by chance yeah uh oh so somebody's not going to be here the whole time anybody else willing to all right um claire maybe Anyone i'll try, else? Maybe Anyone? I'll try Okay. Controversial. Willing. Um, again, you know, it's actually an online note-taking tool. It's fairly easy to use, and multiple people can actually help. It's uh, help, very helpful to do that. You can see the online participant is being mute on, on this subject. Yeah. Thomas often helps, but he has to present. So. He, yes, he can't do both. Why don't we go for it? I'll, I'll see what I can do. Uh, if you're, you're running the show, though, Claire. Yeah, I am. I am. So um, <laughs> there's, there's enough switching between things going on over here. So I am going to turn off my camera and we'll shortly turn off my mic. And I'm going to share. Thomas, I'll share the slides for you unless you want to have a go yourself. Uh, uh, can you hear me, Claire? Be better okay. if, you, if you move the slides for me, please. Absolutely. Not a problem. Um, up on the screen, if you just give me the nod whenever you want me to move the slide. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. So it's 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 a pretty short uh, presentation, uh, folks. But but uh, you know uh, I I think uh, we want to move the architecture draft forward. You know whatever the process is, uh, Wes. Uh, you know for for getting this into working group last call. And that is why I sent that message uh, a couple of weeks back, and and it's been good. Uh, thank you, David, and thank you, uh, Rama, for the feedback. But if people could read through, and if you think there's things missing, if you think there are typos, if you think there are things that are not clear, you know, we would be very appreciative if you could just even like send a one-liner to the mailing list just to to let us know. If you have you know some more deeper questions, you could use the GitHub issues the way uh, Yaron Sheffer did um, last time uh, at the last ITF. And if you're interested, just look at what, you know, the, the things that Yaron asked and, and also see if I have answered um, his concerns sufficiently. Uh, uh, and, um, you know, and uh, if you have any more questions, yeah, pile it on the issues list. Um, I, I think uh, next slide. Um, Claire, I think that's it. I think that's that. This is the this is a request. That here we go. Request. Uh, uh, and, uh, thanks, Thomas. Um, one quick where's, maybe you could give a quick. What what is yeah. the process? Yeah. So um, the the 
as a reminder of the process overall, right? We we have gone through the steps of getting the document into an IETF working group, you know, document so it's now properly like that. When the authors believe that you have finished and it is ready for working group last call, that you know you don't expect any more changes. Um, generally, uh, the chairs can start that process. I will say. I have started reviewing it, and the, the chairs should certainly review it too. And maybe Claire and I should discuss on the side whether we want to submit a bunch of comments to you before we take it to last call. Because if if there's a lot of changes after last call, we won't advance it. We will, you know, bring it back to to have it be redone, and then maybe we do a, a separate last call later. A lot of times we make the first one fairly long, and then we make you know the, if there's revisions, we'll make the the next one you know two weeks instead of four or something like that. Um, I will note that in my initial pass through the document, um, there are elements of the document that go beyond our chartered scope. Um, so we're going to have to be careful about that. In particular, you talked about the API between, you know, inside the network, which is, which is again, outside the scope of what we're able to define. Um, so we can reference that it's needed, but we'll, so I haven't finished my review, but I suspect that there's, there may be a few other places like that as well that, that sort of talks about um, you know, what it might look like, but we shouldn't prescribe what the internals of those networks are going to look like if that's outside our scope, if that makes sense. Yep, yep, thank you. Thanks, Wes. Yeah, any, any review and you know, uh, any comments, folks, would be uh, appreciated. Yeah, so certainly it would be good if the working group could review it and... Um, Last calls ideally should not be overwhelming with comments. <laughs> um, yep. That usually means the discussion wasn't happening. So um, it would be good if, if uh, anybody does want to do detailed review, uh, now's the time. Um, and, and my guess is, and I haven't run this by Claire, so I'll just throw it out of randomly. Um, why don't we give the chairs a couple of weeks to review it um, and see if we think it's ready. And then and if, it, if we think it is, then we'll, we'll issue a last call for 02. Otherwise, you can do a minor revamp to take it to 03 first. Yep. And, and a, special, a special request for, for new folks who are new to working group have, have never read the document. This is a good test for us because if, if you know, newcomers in the future are reading, you know, the document, that like it is, there's enough there for you to understand like the scope and, and the intent. And, yep. and for people that want to make use of SATP related technologies in the future, you want to make sure that this architecture stands up to your eventual use case. Um, so it's a good time to look at it and go, you know, it's incompatible or compatible with my existing work. So note that when we do get to a last call and there's a formal mechanism in the data tracker for doing it, we will put it in last call and, and um, it'll be listed that way. And um, we'll, we'll, the, the chairs will collect comments for things that need to be addressed. Um, and I forget where I was going. It's been a really long week. I'm going to apologize <laughs> now for all of my tiredness. So. <laughs> if, I, if I may, uh, Wes, this is possibly a, a question more than a, a comment. Uh, Thomas mentioned about adding comments to GitHub. My understanding is that all comments and questions should preferably be circulated using the, um, the mailing list. Uh, good question. Is that Barry. a misunderstanding? So, yeah, not necessarily, as long as they're well documented somewhere. Um, in the end, it'll, it will create an update. The, the important thing is that if you're going to use GitHub and create issues or suggested changes in, in GitHub, um, A, mention that on the mailing list that you're collecting in there, and B, don't close them, you know, like five minutes after somebody, you know, creates one or something. Give time for discussion to take place so that you know, the, the, the process is open and transparent, but because GitHub issues and pull requests, you know, are archived, it is a safe, uh, there's actually a whole RFC on how to use GitHub for working groups. And if, and if you want to go that route for discussions, uh, make sure that you read that RFC and sort of try and follow its guidance on, on the right way to do that. But there are many, many RFC uh, uh, working groups that are using GitHub exclusively for um, changes related discussions that aren't major, you know, editorial, things like that. So. Uh, that's just fine. In fact, if you look at the volume of mail in the mailing list, it's been uh, there was a note in the RASPRG working group yesterday, a research group, showing a decline in mail in the IETF, and it's likely a result because of the increase in use of GitHub. 
Absolutely, and, and Ram has had a great point in the the chat channel in the um, if we could ask the important GitHub Git the important GitHub issues be referenced on the mailing list, um, just so people know to go and have a look at them. I think that would be a good practice to adopt. I support that. Okay. Um, any any questions for Thomas uh, regarding the the architecture draft at all? Nope. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you. Thomas, brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, so back to the agenda then, which I don't have open. <laughs> are we are we ready to move on? Is the next speaker ready? Uh, so I, I lost track. Was Raphael not going to be here? And I think, yeah, is someone speaking on behalf of Raphael? I, I am again. Oh, okay. Raphael is... <laughs> He's boarding a plane. <laughs> I see. Right. Okay. That's fine. So um, I'll bring the crash recovery slides up, shall I? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, and I believe Rama, you you also have. Um, yeah. Okay. So let me let me go first, Rama, and then you can jump in afterwards. Okay. So um, Rafael sends his apologies. Um, looked at the wrong time zone, and he's literally boarding an airplane. So didn't want to, you know, do the risk. Uh, next slide, please, uh, uh, Claire. So, so, for folks who who don't know, um, so the, this is this is not on the uh, the, the crash recovery is not a part of the, the you know uh, working group item a list for SATP, but this work had been has been going on I think since two and a half years ago, three years ago, and we thought it would be useful to mention this because uh, there are some implementations out there that that's considering crash recovery. Uh, and I thought, we'd, you know, giving, giving an update to everyone would be uh, useful. So the first thing is, you know, uh, porting this to Markdown, I need to say thank you again to, um, so, so Yaron, Yaron has been uh, helping uh, uh, Raphael uh, move, uh, move all of us, <laughs> move the drafts to uh, a markdown and, and do everything on, on GitHub. Thank you again, uh, Yaron. Uh, so Raphael thinks the draft is uh, stable now, uh, but it could also mean that maybe he's asking for people to review and, and comment. And that's the link to the um, location uh, on GitHub. Uh, and by the way, this is, this, this is, if you notice, ITF sat dash sat B is the new GitHub. In the, in the previous cycle, we had a, a GitHub repo of one of the MIT servers, but I'm, we're slowly moving everything over to this ITS at the, uh, you know, freebie GitHub account. Uh, next slide, please, Claire. Um, so, uh, actually, I don't know if I need to go <laughs> through all of this, uh, but uh, if you are interested in um, submitting issues and so on, or, or in the, if, even managing drafts, here's a quick, uh, you know, quick uh, set of bullets that would know that would help you could help you um next slide please As I said, these materials are all available on data tracker so if anyone wants to come back and review then they they are made available yep uh and implementation i believe uh so there's a there's a paper there for, for those who don't know uh this is also an important part of Raphael's phd work so he's he's got a whole bunch of papers that that you know some of them are, are very good and as usual, tech archive or archive is sort of the, the, the depository for, for preprints that many people use today. Um, next slide, please, Claire. I think that's the end. I wanna, I wanna give uh, Rama as much time as possible. Okay, I'm, I'm done. Okay, any, any questions for Thomas on that at all? No, uh, Rama, I'll bring, Rama, would you like to control the next set of slides or you would you like me to do that for you? Uh, I can share, let me try. Actually, I'm in the new client and I, where exactly the share, but maybe Claire, it would be easier for you to do it, sorry. Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, 
I'm going to talk about uh, an implementation effort that is ongoing. Actually, we've made a lot of progress. We're close to to the end of that project uh, of uh, SATP core, and to some extent, the crash recovery as described in the in the draft that Thomas was just talking about. Uh, and this uh, project has been going on for about um, six months now, uh, due to end at the end of November. So. Uh, Let's move to the next slide. Okay, I showed the slide at the end of uh, my use case presentation. I think in the last ITF. So just wanted to bring it up here to provide to uh, to connect it to that. So what you see on the right is a vision of a network of networks, which this project called Hyperledger Cacti is designed to achieve. So this is a project that uh, consists of a family of tools, libraries, and protocols that enable. Uh, different ledgers to talk to each other and carry out atomic transactions with each other, including uh, secure asset transfer. So uh, there's a uh, this project has about I think a total of uh, four to five years worth of work that's gone into it, and it's actually the result of a merger of two older code projects. So there's a lot of quite mature code code that's been used in uh, production systems. Uh, you can see the link at the top right, and please. Uh, go and visit the site, visit the GitHub repository to find out more about the project. Uh, uh, for those who don't know, Hyperledger is a foundation that was established in uh, 2015, end of 2015, early 2016, as an uh, umbrella for different uh, uh, technologies related to enterprise blockchain. And uh, not just blockchain, generally distributed ledgers. And uh, uh, as, as uh, uh, part of that, uh, uh, Hyperledger... Uh, so there are several different projects on different aspects of blockchain and DAT technology. Uh, one of those being interoperability. So Cacti is one of them. And what uh, the Hyperledger Foundation does every year is it uh, funds uh, uh, certain uh, mentees for a mentorship project, it's kind of an internship project for uh, uh, people in the community to come work on uh, Hyperledger Cacti, uh, or sorry, different Hyperledger, uh, Hyperledger project features and, and to make uh, uh, contributions that way. Uh, so what specifically is being done in this project is you can see at the bottom left uh, there is a, a module called a relay within the hyperledger cacti which uh, the system offers and this relay is uh, basically it has the same function as uh, a gateway as we've been talking about in satp drafts uh, in cacti the relay is a configurable configurable module that's running grpc services and it's built on rust hence the title of the presentation, which is the Rust implementation of SATP. What we want to do is, given this relay, which already performs certain uh, cross-chain functions for uh, networks that can use, that are uh, that are augmented with CACTA capabilities, uh, we're going to be, or we are in the process of adding uh, SATP capabilities to this relay module. So that the relay module can then serve as a, so, so we have code that serves as a template for how you should go about uh, adopting the draft specs and uh, uh, moving assets from one network to another. Uh, it also provides certain samples for particular DLTs. Uh, I'll come to that. Uh, the relay module itself is not built for any specific distributed ledger technology. It's supposed to be DL complete DLT agnostic, yet compatible with any uh, DLT uh, network. Like you can use this relay and connect it uh, for an to an Ethereum network or to a Hyperledger Fabric network, or to uh, any other kind of uh, network, as you can imagine, all the relay would need is a plugin that allows it to talk to that particular network. Uh, we call that a driver. So can you move to the next slide? Uh, not going to go into the details of this, but this actually describes the architecture of a relay. It's built on microservices. And on the left side, you can see the part shaded in yellow just following Thomas's color combination. That is a part that is DLT agnostic and also concerned with uh, SACP. Uh, on the right, what you see is the relay has particular, what we call drivers or, or protocol adapters that allow a relay to talk to particular kinds of networks. You can see some samples on the, on the right, the fabric network, Corda network, or an Ethereum network. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, those drivers use the, that particular networks offered a client library to, to interact with them, to either to query the state of a ledger or to submit a transaction to the uh, shared database. Uh, at the bottom, you can see there are uh, the spec, the link to the spec and also to the code for this particular module. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is how, uh, this is exactly what we are trying to finally 
demo with the uh, project that's ongoing. Uh, you can see two networks at either end, and there are two relays in the middle. Relays basically are SAP gateways, and uh, one of the protocols that they can talk with each other is asset transfer or or SAP SAP core to be precise. Uh, what's going on behind? As you can see, either to the left or the or to the right, the relays have particular drivers. that allow them to talk to uh, that particular network in this case this driver will be a, a hyperledger fabric driver it's it's a plugin uh, actually it's implemented as a separate service but it's something that the relay uh, can be configured to talk to uh, and uh, th that has the uh, that understands how to talk to this particular network type so what you see here is we uh, uh, in this particular project we are building the uh, features for satp in the in the shaded part in the middle so the relays are now augmented with uh, the various functions that they need to perform uh, for the various satp functions and uh, they'll have the ability to uh, both send and receive uh, satp messages uh, according to the particular stage that the relay uh, that the relay is in and they also are going to be running the satp state machine so that they can uh, uh, store their proper information log their appropriate uh, messages and know how to recover from crashes uh, again going back to the left and the right you see there are applications at the top left and the top right those are sort of the trigger point if you want an uh, somebody to uh, issue an asset transfer instruction or a, or a request and uh, you can have a, the relay to the left is going to be then negotiating with the relay to the right uh, that's sort of stage 0 and then stage 1 and then when they carry out an asset uh, complete asset transfer uh of course that part of the asset transfers part of each particular step for example the locking part or the uh or the minting and issuing part those will involve not just operations in the relay but operations that the relay drives into the network so it will have to issue those instructions to the network via the driver wait for the response and then uh, continue the the process next slide please uh so uh, not going to go in details this is just for reference uh, if you go to the uh, if you visit the pull request at the bottom you'll see this is currently a, a draft pull request and we are still uh, working on integrating it into the into the main branch uh, just to suffice at a high level there are some additional features that were added to the relay which is a grp service we so we added another new service to the relay called the satp service and uh, we created a new protobuf structure which consists of the service interface and uh, we made some augmentations to existing rather simple hyperledger fabric applications that serve to demonstrate uh, the uh, burning of an asset in one ledger and the uh, consequent issuing of the asset in another ledger pursuant to how satp works up next slide please uh, so this is just a snapshot of the of the code just as a proof that uh, you know this this was provided to me by Zach Wan who's the one who's implementing this uh, so you can see here the relay you can see the rust code uh, and uh, if you look at the uh, i just mapped a few of the messages from the satp protocol on the right to the to functions that are implemented uh, within the satp service as you can see <clears throat> uh, next slide please uh this is just the snapshot of the satp protobuf as again you can see the various functions that the relay is supposed to do according to satp protocol those are defined uh, defined here uh, reason to do the protobuf is so that this is uh, technology uh, agnostic so you can take the same protobuf and maybe tomorrow somebody wants to write a, a different kind of a, a relay with in a different kind of language or uh, they want to communicate the relay with the driver that is built on some other uh, language like javascript java go you can use the same protobuf you don't have to change this particular uh, interface next slide uh so this is just one sample function so if you think of stage 1 step 1.1 uh, we're doing a transfer proposal claims operation uh so this is just next few slides just point to the function we can jump from one slide to another quite rapidly so this is it's performing the uh, this is slide which performing a lock request actually this is a mistake this should not be stage One step, one point one. It's a, it's a. I should have integrated the different uh, number. Apologies for that. Next slide, please. So uh, this is just going through the the steps. There there are particular function calls. Next slide. So uh, eventually, this uh, perform lock will go to a a driver. So you can see the top right. There's a get driver client. Driver client means that the fabric driver which this relay is communicating with 
is going to get handed to the driver client and then it's going to issue a lock request to that driver and the driver in turn will then uh, invoke a lock on the on the network next slide please uh, so this is a code from a, a chain code. So a chain code, uh, for those who don't know, is the fab hyperledger fabric equivalent of a smart contract, uh, which is the piece of code that uh, ultimately manages assets on the ledger. So uh, we have some very basic sample chain codes implemented within Cacti to serve as a reference. Uh, one of these is just a, a simple asset management chain code, and that was augmented by Zakwan to create a, a chain code called SATP simple asset. And there we have a, it's just pointing to a particular function that ultimately will assign an asset to an, uh, to the recipient whenever uh, that operation happens. Next slide. Uh, so to support, now what I showed you uh, in the demo, we have support for, or we built uh, support for uh, two fabric networks to transfer asset to each other. So what do you need if you, want, if you have a different kind of network or even a different kind of uh, database at the behind the relays? So the relay itself is DLT agnostic. So what the work that's gone on for uh, adding SATP support to the relay, uh, that's that's uh, once and uh, uh, you don't have to repeat it again. Uh, Hyperledger Cacti already supports connectivity to other kinds of DLTs uh, like Bezu, uh, permission to Ethereum, uh, Quorum, Corda, Hyperledger, Sawtooth, etc. What you need to do is to build a new uh, connector or driver for each. Some of them already exist in Cacti, so you just need to augment those drivers to uh, talk the uh, to the relay SATP services, and you need to make some additions to the client libraries to trigger the asset transfer functions, and you need to augment the sample apps or which which are the smart contracts or the distributed apps that are offered for, for those particular networks. So uh, some augmentations needed in, in these, but otherwise the, the core uh, SATP function, the relay, uh, that, that is done once and does not need to be repeated again. Next slide. Um, before we move ahead, there's yeah. a question. If, sure. Um, uh, sorry, uh, uh, yes, you, please. is that something that's relevant to this slide or, or the presentation in general? Hi, it's Peter. Uh, just a quick question. So here is that the relay is uh, DLT agnostic. The question is, uh, is that, uh, is it a version agnostic? Uh, so like version of, yeah. Version of Sorry, different DLTs. A little closer to the microphone. Okay. So the version of different DLTs. So maybe like uh, when, um, like different DLTs you are interoperable with, they might have different versions that, uh, right. uh, I don't know if that will impact uh, on your um, relay uh, right. Can, can you go back to slide three? I can talk, I can respond to the question with that in the background. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so you can see here the relay, which is the, the part on the, on the left, the, the big box, uh, forget the yellow part. So what the relay has is if you look at the part on the left, that is the DLT agnostic part. And if you look at the three boxes on the right, they are marked for three protocol adapters, right? So those are what we call the drivers. Uh, there's another term used in Cacti called, also called the connector driver connector either either way it just means it, it's a module that has the ability to get a relay to talk to that particular network type so the part on the left that does not care that cares neither about the dlt nor about the dlt version the part on the right it does so if a, if a particular dlt uh, gets upgraded to new version yeah you will have to either upgrade that particular driver on the driver module on the right or you have to build a new new driver which is compatible with the uh, upgraded dlt Okay, so the uh, the platform SDK is something that you have to manually, you know, program up, uh, you know, update the programming. Yes. Or okay, yeah. I yeah, that, I think that's some engineering or ma maintenance uh, effort. Um, Definitely, uh, it will involve some maintenance effort. Yeah. With, so within Cacti, you will have to. Uh, in fact, we we constantly keep doing this. I mean, we have a. Uh, if you look at the Cacti issues and the PRs over a period of time, you'll see that uh, we, we are quite agile to. Uh, DLTs uh, getting upgraded, uh, and also, um, of course, uh, just uh, updates to JavaScript or Go and uh, and all those things. But yeah, we are sensitive to DLTs getting upgraded. So, for example, uh, Hyperledger Fabric it's um, getting to the 3.0 version, but uh, it's uh, recently I think a 2.5 version was released. So uh, over a period of time, people uh, have tried to keep pace with the later versions of Fabric which may or may not be backward compatible with the older versions of Fabric. So yeah, it is a constant maintenance stuff. That's, that's something we cannot unfortunately uh, avoid because uh, the way you talk to a DLT is 
very specific to that particular DLT. And we, the the way we are trying to engineer interoperability is we want to uh, uh, keep the give as much freedom to the DLTs to evolve in their own way. And we feel that the responsibility of people who are main, building interoperability tools is to uh, use the DLT as it currently exists rather than demand something over DLT. Okay, it's just uh, when you are supporting more and more DLTs, I think your workload to maintain this thing is, uh, is, is high. It's getting larger and larger. So if any way that could automate the process would be great. It's just a comment. Thanks. Sure. No, that's a point very well taken. That, that's why it's an open source project and we really solicit all the help we can get from the community. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a, a question, not as a chair though. Um, uh -huh. Is there any intention or, or ambition to extend this beyond DLT, so extend it to other sort of nascent networks that may exist within um, banking systems, for instance? Yes, absolutely. It's just that uh, uh, we need people to work on it. <laughs> we haven't had the bandwidth yet, but, but absolutely, that is within the scope. Thank you. And then I think Mike was next. Yeah, uh, Mike McBride, I, I think Claire asked the exact question I was going <laughs> to ask, is that this, this is great, by the way, but... Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a DLT. It could be Hyperledger to some other non-DLT, more traditional database, potentially, correct? There's nothing correct. magical about it being a DLT. No. OK. And speaking briefly as a chair, that's part of the, the scope of this, is that it needs to be network agnostic outside of DLT. Um, I was just interested in this particular implementation. So thank you again for expanding on that. And then um, uh, we have a, another speaker in the queue, Zainan. So the first one I want to ask is uh, also this the, the one that Claire has asked and and I was showing it in the demo that when I come up with that this is also um, a very good uh, demonstration of needed um, and the, my second question uh, uh, is that can you elaborate uh, when it is a DLT, right? The, the first question is it can extend to non DLTs, but what good thing about the DLT is that it usually uh, within the DLTs, the message are cryptographically verifiable and the states are uh, verified, publicly verifiable as well. And so when they, when some of them are DLTs, can you elaborate in which step in the workflow and which component in the system that verifies the message uh, that let's say one asset is already mint or burned, uh, locked or unlocked in one of the network? And yeah. Okay. So, uh... Larger point, uh, I think the uh, communication of uh, proof that uh, a ledger is not double spend something, we are not actually transferring that across SATP. That's at least not part of the SATP scope right now. Uh, though uh, th there are other, uh, uh, I have a draft on views and view communication, which actually does deal with that that issue. In, in SATP right now, uh, any operation where the relay is hitting the driver, relay is asking the driver to do something, that is actually going through that particular network's consensus process because the driver is just a client which has a wallet identity for the network. Driver is not something that that can change the driver, the network's or the ledger state or the database's state by on its own. So uh, the the driver uh, because it's uh, sort of part of the security domain of the relay, it is kind of trusted to be uh, uh, a genuine client and not not a, not a malicious agent. So uh, as long as the driver just has the ability to submit transaction, and as long as the we trust the that the ledger or the network itself has not suffered any uh, Byzantine failure, I think the that's uh, we can assume that the ledger internally has not uh, there's no double spending there or, or the integrity of the ledger is maintained. So, yeah, does that answer your question? I think yeah. at this point, any any operation that goes through the driver that uh, we can be assured that it is uh, maintaining the ledger's integrity. Yeah, with with my Chair hat back on. I'll yeah. remind everybody that the scope of this working group included uh, how to transfer digital assets between multiple different types of networks, some of which may be public ledgers, some of which may be private ledgers, some of which may be databases. And uh, there is an expectation that there are agreements between these different networks, you know, um, that, that will use, serve as the basis, right? There's no uh, legal framework. Uh, that could be instantiated into a protocol to make it actually work. So um, in the same way that routing happens over legal frameworks and things like that too, um, that, that you have to believe the other side is doing what you expected. So 
it may be that you know uh, an asset is transferred from a public to a public ledger, and then you can verify that afterwards. But it may be that an asset is transferred to um, a private bank or something, and um, you know the this the protocol verification will ensure that the the original one was maybe burnt in public, but um, the, the promise that it was not done differently in private requires the, the agreement between the two networks to come into play at that point. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. TLDR, we were trying to be generic with the protocol. <laughs> Understood. I uh, I think that my um, I, that that point is well taken, and I just uh, want to ask within within the scope that um, a component will be able to verify the credentials or the um, um, any proofs that um, attested to the the facts that the other side has done what the SDK asked them to do, and uh, it is. Totally okay. That is not within the scope. Uh, but uh, we, I think, is. I wonder if this question has been asked and if the, the decision has been made. So, Victor, just take a look at the uh, the two uh, separate drafts, which are not part of the scope right now. Uh, views and view requests. So they talk about this uh, communicating communicating proofs and verifying proofs across networks. So sure, we're happy I to discuss that can, with you. Yeah. He does ask a good question. Uh, do you support that? within your relay to the network module, um, you know, within your network implementation on the network side of, of the SAT protocol, do you support verification in some API mechanism, right? Is that good, Victor? Oh, I think I'll, I'll, I'll follow up on, on reading that uh, reference. Thank you, yeah. So uh, one thing I've not gone into here, but you'll actually find this in the documentation to answer your question, Wes. So the relays were envisioned as a module that uh, serve either one or more of uh, that particular network's constituent members. So uh, I think that particular trust that you're talking about is already inbuilt. And uh, we actually used a quite a stringent trust model, which is more stringent than what SATP currently has, which is that it does not matter if uh, uh, which of the network's members Run that relay. The they cannot maliciously uh, tamper with the network state. Thank you, Rama. Um, we're just over time uh, allocated to this particular piece. Was there anything yeah, else that sorry. you were off? Uh, I think if you can just go past. I think there was just a, a, a couple of slides on logging, and so I wanted to flash them because yes. uh, I think we went into. Uh, uh, just go, yeah. Just go a couple of slides before before this. Okay. Uh, one one more. Yep. We're out. Of, we're out of time. So just if you could. Right. So this is just uh, for folks. Just please take a look. This is how the log logging was implemented. So if you can move further down, I think three more slides. Uh, status also. You can take a look. Uh, next slide, please. Just want to quickly tell people about this. So these are uh, some feedbacks from uh, Zach who implemented the. The protocol and uh, he had some because not everything was very straightforward to implement so uh, as you can see i made a note on some of these like the second one that the interface between the gateway and the driver is not clear he said which is true but that's out of scope for satp it's something that we had to do uh, we had to brainstorm on our own so uh, we can maybe take these issues on the mailing list thank you thank you very much my one, my one question is did you find issues with the protocol and you did so yes please do file those yeah Definitely. Fabulous. Thank you so much for that. Um, I am going to employ the uh, Wes just just reminded me there is a, a new feature called a timer. So rather than me clock watching, we can we can have the timer on for the next next speaker. Um, any any further questions at all for for Rama's presentation? And thank you again. That was a very good summary. No. Okay. Thank you. Um, so moving on then, I believe uh, we have Victor who has his uh, five minute demo. Are you comfortable sharing your own screen or would you like me to do, or have, have, is there something that's been, oh, you have requested to share screen. Uh, yeah, let me see if I can share the screen. Yeah, absolutely. And let me just approve that out. There we go. And also does it play the, um, does it play the, 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 the sound? That is a yeah. good question. It's a very good question. It goes beyond my knowledge. So try it and and see. I think is the answer. Okay. So uh, this is a, a demo of uh, how we can uh, use NFT to represent ownership and change use 
when you uh, NFT change hands, they can change the control of the domain, and then it demonstrates the need for a um, um, a, a protocol like uh, SATP uh, to coordinate the complexity um, within and between and registrars and, and registries. So let's see if it works out. Can you can you hear me? Can you hear it? No. Oh, I can hear. Okay. Um, you can. I can. Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll just um, narrate myself. So basically, this is the uh, um, um, uh, uh, interface that we create, and then you can register the domain, um, and by using uh, metadata to uh, so MetaMask to log in, and then you will see that uh, if we have uh, our own tokens to per uh, um, just like payment uh, payment uh, US dollars we can use it to register. This is very similar to how GoDaddy works, except where the payment is on chain and also the NFT is on chain. And uh, as in the demo, we implement this and deploy it on Sapolia Ethereum test network. And, and it's an op you can see the NFT on OpenSea. So the first part demonstrate how to register. And let me navigate to the second part, which is when, how do you use, uh, how do you use the, uh, you use it to, um, uh, to control, uh, use the NFT or to control the ownership and the ability to uh, uh, manage the D uh, DNS record. And this is a typical uh, DNS record management. So for example, like this uh, vitalik.tech is one that we want to um, allow manage in a different user, right? And so uh, currently it's under control of Alice, but then um, if you log out and log in with another tester, which is Becca, Becca doesn't have that, uh, doesn't have that NFT and doesn't have then doesn't have the control of that uh, domain names. So you will see when when, when she logs in, uh, there's no uh, domains. Uh, the Vitalik.tech is not under her name. But um, when Alice uh, log in and Alice trying to um, send the NFT over to um, to Beka, so. Um, Let's say um, Alice uh, will sign a transaction and uh, send the NFT to um, to to, uh, to to Becca and waiting for the transaction to go through. So basically, at this point, we're sending, we're confirming that uh, Alice is sending the trans, uh, the NFT to uh, to Becca, and uh, everyone can verify this is in in a in a test net of uh, of Ethereum, and once that's done, once that's done, uh, Alice no longer have the domain in her uh, dashboard, and when Becca log in. It will show up on Becca's um, dashboard. So, this is um, generally demonstrating um, uh, NFT being used as the ownership uh, control. Now, I wanna um, I wanna show that uh, I wanna uh, say that this demonstration shows that the complexity in this process is that when um, there is an NFT being minted. Uh, we know that the control of the uh, of the domain now is in the hand of um, of the of the NFT and NFT owner, and then the um, there should be a lock for the registrar to not send it out or to to avoid it. And that's one thing that needs to be coordinated. And then the other one is to coordinate settlement. For example, when there is a payment, or I don't know if it, this is what asset exchange. Uh, uh, refer to here, but when there is a payment involved that only a payment is uh, is sent and is, is settled uh, and a registration or a new renewal is done, um, there is also a need of coordination in the protocol. So um, I just want to say that as a uh, implementer of this, 
uh, using DLT or using Ethereum as a way to control domain ownership to represent it, it shows a need for something like uh, uh, SAFT, uh, SATP. Yeah, I'm done. Sorry uh, for a bit over time. No, it's okay. I, I would say that was pretty, pretty closely timed, so thank you very much for that. Um, yeah, is there any questions or comments on, on that, that demo at all? Uh, we're, we're waiting, Victor, that was helpful. Um, I would encourage mm -hmm. everybody in the working group that wants to consider whether this use case should go into the document or not. There's an active thread. Please do go comment with your opinion on yay or nay um, so that we can decide whether it goes into the official use case document. I don't see anybody in the queue, so I think we're good. Again, thank you, Victor. That's uh, really useful. And uh, to echo that, if we could vote on, including, on the inclusion of that. Um, moving on then, I think we're just about on time for the report from the network identification design team. I think Thomas and, and <coughs> are going to share this. Uh, again, would you like me to present, Thomas? Yes, please. Thank you, Claire. <laughs> Over to you. Uh, uh, next sl slide, please. Um, so, so a bit of background for those who are, who are new here. So this uh, discussion, I think, started um, two months ago. And and the decision at two interim meetings ago was uh, to create a, a subgroup that would you know, go away and work on this. And the subgroup uh, has met, I think, three times and will be meeting some more times uh, because there's uh, apparently more complexity that we did not think about. But the problem is listed here. I've, I've written as goals, but, but, but basically, um, you know, when you want to do a, a cross network transfer, uh, and you're creating a, a transaction for the cross network. If the if the destination network has a fork in it, there's a possibility that you might end up on the wrong fork, right? And so that 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 problem means that when you create a destination address of a network, you you need to also include which fork. You know, if should there be a fork, which side of the fork, or it could be multiple forks, which side of the fork, you know, you wanna, you wanna get into. Um, the same thing, but but in doing so, it doesn't mean that um, a local transaction needs to care about the whole uh, network address. It it couldn't, it it may not even be aware of the existence of uh, a fork within its own network, right? So this is, uh, and then thirdly, which is I think the the harder part, which is. Um, you know, how, how do you legally say, you know, we own this address, you know, so, so if good example is if, if uh, you know, a bunch of uh, companies get together and they want to create their own private closed, you know, network, um, you know, and they say, well, this is, this is our network level address. How, how do they declare that to the world? Now, uh, I know Wes, Wes is well, not very knowledgeable about this, but I think if, an example of this is your AS number, uh, and I think uh, you get that. Is it Aaron Wes that issues those um, AS numbers for the ISPs? Uh, you get them. <laughs> it, it gets through IANA actually. IANA. Okay. Yeah. So, so this equivalent does not exist for asset networks. So that's that's sort of the third bullet, uh, and and. The, the fourth sort of requirement there is that, uh, as we saw uh, earlier, the, the, the gateways need to also understand, uh, maybe it's embedded part of the semantics, that, that the system behind um, the gateway is actually a, a monolithic system, like a real-time gross settlement you know, system or, or, or banks. And the, the other thing that makes it really complicated is that it needs to be backward compatible with some of the major networks out there in particular with um, Ethereum. Um, next, next slide, please, um, Claire, thank you. So, so this is, <laughs> for those who, who know what a TLV is, you can, you can go to sleep. This is just uh, sort of a quick uh, uh, you know, uh, summary of, of why we're looking at uh, TLVs. I know on the mailing list, you'll see people saying, why don't you use Cbor? And, and my point is like, <laughs> slow down about the format. Let's just, let's just understand the, the, the need and one possible structure to represent this. And so the group has been looking at, you know, the idea of devoting eight bits, the first eight bits to identifying the type of network. And uh, type, type one is gonna be public permissionless with 
a Genesis block. Type two is the same thing, but private close also with a Genesis block. And type, th type three are the monolithic um, system, RTGS systems and so on that doesn't have a Genesis block. And the reason you'll see it later on is that um, the, the, the way um, Drash Zhang has, has uh, got it right now and the way it's, it's being used in uh, Ethereum, the Genesis block uh, is used to distinguish forks. So, uh, the, you know, if there is a fork, then one of them is going to use the Genesis block. The other fork is going to use a hash of the block just prior before the branch. So it's very clear, you know, the distinguish, you know, direction of, of the fork. And uh, recently, I think uh, two weeks ago, probably even more recent, there was this question about L2, layer two blockchain. So for fo folks who don't know, it's, it's a pretty... How do I say this politely? It's a pretty new thing, and there's there's no settlement. I mean, there's no agreed meaning of, of layer two, but but in some networks, uh, speed is a problem, and so the the general proposal is that some of these operations would be conducted away from the network, off chain. Stuff occurs, and when everybody's happy, it get it gets rolled back into the main network. So it's called roll up. But there are multiple ways of doing this, and if you're interested, you can see um, the email that Weija posted, I think, last week, giving a summary for this meeting. And I, I know he's supposed to join us today, but but he said, you know, he may be late or may not even be able to make it. So in the next two slides, we're going to look at the, the type one and type two uh, addresses with the Genesis block. Uh, ne next um, slide, please, Claire. So, so the the subgroup decided well we we kind of need the default mode and it needs to be 32 bytes primarily because this is the 32 bytes that's being used uh for ethereum so the, the reason of this is backward compatibility there, there are some systems that only want 32 bytes uh and and no more and so um in the in the in the current iteration draft yang zero there's seven bytes being uh, accorded being given to the reserve, but the current uh, state of discussion is that we could reduce uh, that seven into four bytes uh, and be able to use one of the bytes as a checksum. So in this particular uh, style, this is the default mode, it's only 32 bytes. Uh, byte position 31 is actually not used, right? Uh, and you'll see in the next slide, it will be used, but this is what it looks like. But the important thing about this one is that um, the second eight bits, uh, which is the, the length of the, the L, is all zeros because there's no there's no need to indicate the length because we know exactly what it is. It is you know from two to thirty one, and, and and this is uh, this is I think uh, also explained on uh, the mailing list. Now uh, and the Genesis block is the sixteen bytes then you know seven position seven to uh, two to seventeen. Um, next slide, please, Claire. Uh, so uh, if, if a particular network that has a Genesis block needs more space than 32 bytes, then they will use the extended uh, length block, in which case the, the L you know, byte uh, is going to be used as usual. And it's going to indicate the length in bytes. So it's going to retain pretty much the same you know, byte seven to thirty-one is is, you know, as as before, uh, but now uh, uh, byte thirty-one is going to be used as the checksum for the remainder all the way to byte position two eighty-seven, and so you're given two hundred sixty-six bytes addition for you know specific uh, uh, network identification you know needed for this uh, uh, type two network. So type two is. Uh, private closed permission, but with a Genesis block. So that means that the Genesis block is still going to be recorded uh, in byte two to byte 17, which is the 16 bytes. So it's, it's kind of the same format, you know, basically with additional stuff at the end. And why, why is this? Because there was some discussion that there might be networks who would like to use human readable characters in addition to, you know, the, the, the machine readable uh, address and so the human readable portion would be byte 32 onwards.
Thanks. Is is far less than two hundred fifty six bytes. <clears throat> um, okay, uh, next slide, please. Um, so so this is what the current uh, draft Zhang zero zero looks like, and so we're going to reduce four seven into four, and that's just reserved uh, for you know future needs. Uh, next slide. Um, uh, and that's it. And um, so we continue. That's kind of just a report up to the to the group. We will continue uh, discussions, um, particularly about about L two, about layer two. Uh, Dennis, I don't know if you want to add anything about this uh, L two because, because this is this is uh, an interesting uh, problem that uh, that it's it's worth for us in this subgroup to consider because I mean, in my mind, we have to design this for thirty years out, and so. Uh, you know, we would like to avoid, you know, having to redo everything in, in 15 years uh, just because we didn't consider layer two. D Dennis, you want to you yes. say something Hello. about layer Do two? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, one of the issues of layer two, as we're discussing, is that it's practically impossible to understand in which uh, DLT layer one are anchoring the transactions. So that's one issue here that we have to address. We might be pretending, for example, uh, anchoring transactions in Ethereum, but actually not doing it. So it is a whole discussion about how we will identify uh, L2 networks and how we'll make sure that uh, practically it ends up uh, having all the, the checks and cryptographic guarantees that we need for layer one. So this is still an option, open subject. So that's, that's all I can say for the moment. Thank you. And we Thank have uh, Wes wanting to approach the mic. Yeah, I'm at the mic. Um, uh, thank you, Thomas. That was that was useful, I guess, um, from a working group point of view. Do you have an estimate on the time left needed to sort of wrap up your proposal? Uh, so we've scheduled two more subgroup meetings. Uh, I mean, I, I feel the last three has been very productive. And, and so if we get two more meetings, if, if we could somehow have some kind of a scheme or extension to address this crazy layer two thing, I say crazy because when you talk to different people, they mean different things. And there's different technologies, how to merge, how to anchor to the main you know, network. But hopefully two more meetings. I think, as I said, at the interim meeting, it'd be good if we could you know, write this up by the next IETF. Which is going to be in in March, but that's kind of you know our goal. Okay. Um, follow on. Well, one note to the entire working group, right? The design team is building a recommendation. Uh, the working group gets to make the final call on whether it's the right solution or you know there's other things. So it's a, it's just a deep enough dive into a subject that needs more thought that we created a design team for it. Um, to and the anyone design. welcome if if anybody wants to um join in yeah you know, I think we post the zoom link on the um on the mailing list um, for things to, to to make sure that you think about I think that your note a second ago Thomas was spot on that you need to be thinking about what does it take 30 years from now for this whole system to keep working um, so one thing I'd I'd consider is make sure that what you are coming up with is properly architected in such a way that it fits in the SAT protocol itself, uh, which, you know, uses JSON and types of encoding so that, you know, you keep talking about bits and bytes, which is fine, but the reality is, is the way that that might be encoded in the final protocol might be in a slightly different form. So I, I would stick to a consistent terminology between the core protocol and what this looks like in terms of encoding. Um, yep. No, good point. Thank you, Wes. Yeah. Uh, one other thought about um, if you're going to end up creating a registry in the in IANA for the tags associated with this, um, it's often very common to put in one private use value so that two interoperating networks can actually agree to some format that is not necessarily a standard definition. Um, so, so do consider that potentially um, it's often allocated as the very last value in the range, so 254 or something like that. 
two, three, five. Okay, cool. No, thank you. That's good input. And there was another question that went away, but I didn't see who it was. Oh, and we're over to okay. No, I, I think that was everything. Okay. Any any questions, folks? Otherwise, uh, mailing list and and look at wages email from like I think three days ago, four days ago. That provides a very sort of detailed summary. Thank okay. you, Thomas. Thank you, Mayor. Cheers. Right, and then our last uh, scheduled speaker for today is Dennis. Um, Dennis, same question. Are you wanting to share yeah. your own? Slides? Yes, please. If you can share, yeah, that would be nice. Oh, absolutely. Perfect. So the, the whole discussion about the asset profiles is about the, the context in which the uh, SATP is, is operating. So the, the idea is to describe um, as precisely as possible the assets being transferred because there is a part of negotiation before SATP starts on whether we could... Uh, uh, do you hear me? Yes, you're good. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, whether the transfer could be accepted on one on, on the other side. So as part of the whole discussion on the context of the transfer of SATP, we're discussing about asset profiles. So there is also a proposal to change a bit the vocabulary to be more precise because we're not talking about profiles, we're talking about the a schema definition, so a higher level type definition of what an asset is. So next slide, please. If we set, can set the context here is, uh, as you see in the bottom is also the first slide that we saw. It is the SATP protocol transferring assets from one gateway to the other, which means that there, is, there are the systems behind the gateways. Systems could be networks or monolithic. Um, that hold the, the asset instances. So the, the important is here to define what is the, the asset and how we can define it in a more generic way. So as we could see the schema here, we have the, the asset schemas that are defined by the specific authority. I mean, the legal entity that in a specific jurisdiction has the right to define uh, what a asset on a specific domain is. And then there are issuers, which are also legal entities that instantiate the asset on a specific case, on a specific industry. So if we can uh, switch to the next slide, here's the uh, vocabulary also very important is that we are having, what we are aiming at the working group is to define a general definition of what an asset schema is. Uh, and I'll show a bit the, the different uh, kind of attributes that we believe are important as part of this general definition. And then by specializing this asset schema, we can define per industry specific cases. For example, in the, uh, the example that we see the demo we saw about the DNS uh, transfer, uh, one type asset that we can think it's the, what is the definition of a tokenized DNS domain, for example. If we take the uh, supply chain, the bill of lading, for example, could be an asset that has a schema that is defined with specific attributes and specific characteristics. Or if we take the in finance, the over-the-counter trading, for example, we can imagine that an asset could be a tokenized commodity, for example, like say gold, for example. So the idea here is to be able to specify more semantically what an asset is and during the negotiation between the transfer between two networks through their gateways, there is also the definition of the asset schemas that is uh, uh, exchanged somehow. So the gateways can, can decide whether they can go for a, a transfer on the specific asset uh, associated to a particular schema. So the two layers, as we saw, it's the general definition and there is the specific industry definition of assets. Now, when it comes to networks, we instantiate these assets. So it could be a bill of lading with a specific identifier, or it could be a 
tokenized commodity being gold, for example, for a specific asset custodian, or there is a uh, tokenized domain for a specific uh, Vitalik.tech, for example, uh, in the example that we saw before, that are instances that are managed by the networks. Network, again, could be monolithic systems or DLTs or, or um, you know, other technologies. So having said that, uh, what we are aiming is, uh, of course, to move that to an RFC that is part of the context of how SATP could work. And um, we have defined in the next slide, uh, Claire, a set of components of what an asset schema uh, should contain. So first of all, it's very important to uh, uh, identify uh, the asset. So there is a definition of a unique ID in the specific network that is the on-chain part. And there is definitely uh, an off-chain part as well because there might be assets that don't live inside uh, the network, but there be uh, also you know, outside uh, in an off-chain uh, world. So there is any sort of uh, off-chain network uh, identifier that should also be part of the asset definition. Besides also the normative identification, because for example, if we have easing codes, if we have financial instruments, then we have also uh, normative code definitions. So the kind of code that we're using and eventually any sort of description that could be like a key information document, uh, like prospectus of the asset, it's also part of the, the identification. Now, the one very important next uh, component of the asset schema is the set of attributes. So basically the data, the data structure of the asset. So what kind of data the asset uh, contains with a specific structure. So definitely uh, JSON-LD is a good candidate with a precise definition of the basic data types that could be, uh, should be open. So any sort of schema definition should do, could be from schema.org to other vocabularies. Um, so that's one important uh, component of the asset schema. Now, the other part, it's also uh, related to the capabilities that this, the asset uh, has. For example, uh, in which network uh, we can transfer towards which network. So typically you can say that we have an asset living in Polygon and can only be transferred to uh, EVM compatible network, for example, to be, uh, I don't know, either Ethereum or other, or even Hyperledger Bezu if it is a private network. So the allowed uh, networks to be transferred could be a capability, as well as what we are also defining here as tradability, which is against which uh, asset this asset could be traded with. For example, if it is a domain uh, I can allow only USDC uh, as a payment uh, and not Ether, for example. So these are kind of constraints that could be part of the capabilities, the, the tradability in the specific case. So other things is also about the life cycle of the, the asset. So in some networks, if I take Hedera, for example, or uh, uh, Ethereum or, or Tezos, there may be different um, basic uh, uh, operations that could be applied. So there might be, uh, of course, minting and burning, but there are, might be other things that may not be compatible. So the way to extinguish the asset is also part of the constraints on the definition of the asset. So we can make sure that when uh, the one is deleted on one network, it is created on the other network, so we don't have duplications, for example. Now, other things that are not necessarily very technical, but they are very important, it's whether the asset could be taxed, whether the asset be collateralized or even confiscated by some uh, legal authorities in specific jurisdictions. So all of these things uh, could be part of the capabilities. And if we move to the other sections that we foresee in the asset schema is of course, any sort of ownership that could be from the creator to processor to distributor. I mean, processor is very important also in the EU with uh, GDPR, uh, the distributors, the custodians, the owners, should all have the specific identification. Now, in terms of compliance, it's also the fact that there may be assets that are audited. For example, in the European Union, we have all the, uh, the definitions about the circularity, uh, claims about the, the assets that could be transferred over uh, circular supply chains. 
So the fact that we have um, audits on the specific assets, it's something that could be reflected in the schema. So who has audited the asset and uh, if there is evidence of the audit and eventually some uh, expirations dates of the, the validity of the asset. And also, last part, the jurisdiction of, of the asset. So defining uh, what kind of asset there may be, uh, jurisdictions where the asset could be uh, seen as utility, other where it could be seen as, as a different um, type of um, uh, kind of asset. So the definition of jurisdiction and the, uh, uh, the way that, that we can trade the asset in the specific jurisdiction is also important. Uh, next slide. So when it comes to instantiating the asset in a specific network, um, there are definitely some requirements in terms of processing. So we should be able to identify the asset, have a, res a reference to the schema uh, of the asset, uh, being able to track the asset if it has been moved from one network to the other. So we know that it's extinguished in the one network and moves in another one. And uh, there are other processing uh, constraints also that we should be able to serialize the asset instance to persist it. And when we deserialize it from persistence to keep the same stable uh, hash, for example, uh, so all of these are uh, specific technicalities and there are also related RFCs for serializing, for signing the assets. So these are all part of how we, we imagine the, the processing of, of the assets on the specific networks and how this could interfere with the, uh, the way that the gateways also uh, are, are managing the transfer. And of course, I mean, as we're discussing about uh, more semantic uh, contexts here, a discovery of, uh, of assets is also a service that we could contemplate as part of the overall definition of how the transfer and the, the directory of asset and the discovery could, could, could take place. So that's it. Thank you very much. If you have questions. Brilliant. Thank you, Dennis. Um, and just before we move into questions, if I may, uh, a note from me and, and on behalf of the chairs to say that this is not currently inside um, existing Definitely. scope, but is a, is a proposal for potential future scope, which obviously um, some fantastic work already done. And we have a question here from Rama. Hey, Dennis. Uh, hey, hey, Dennis. Yeah, thanks. Uh, a quick question and a longer question. It's a quick question referring to bullet number three on the slide. Uh, I was I was thinking about uh, trackability across networks. So when you say previous ID, uh, that includes the network ID of the previous, that should include the network ID of the previous network, right? Could be, yes. And, and could be eventually a reference to the, the previous asset instance. If, for example, uh, uh, it is burned, but you can keep trace of what it was. Eventually, you can have a reference on the previous asset. Say the ID of the asset in the previous network is this, and now we are there. So it could be more than the network. It could be also the uh, the former instance in the previous network, for example. Right. right. No, no I, I totally agree. It should have the ID of the asset in the previous instance. I, I was just uh, saying that in addition, it should have the previous network ID as well, so that we can trace which network it uh, yeah. belonged to before it came to this network, right? Definitely. And, and one question would be that whether in the definition of the asset ID, we include the network ID. Uh, so there be high probability that as part of the ID of the asset, we include the ID of its network. Yeah, that, I think, yeah, I think that makes sense. Yeah. That's uh, it's because an ID is unique only within that network's namespace, right? So sure. that's, that's what, yeah. sure. Uh, sorry, uh, a longer question. Uh, I'm channeling Zach Wan, who implemented SATP, and this is an, a point mentioned in the in the presentation I gave as well. Um, so he had a concern about, suppose a gateway crashes and then recovers, and then it discovers that it cannot lock a particular asset because the asset's already in the lock state. Uh, now, we don't actually know just by the asset being logged, whether it was logged by this gateway before it crashed or whether it's logged by a completely unrelated process. So uh, should we, you think, have a augment the schema that you're uh, discussing with some kind of a universal uh, state exposure mechanism for, for an asset that tells uh, that, that 
you know allows a gateway to query the state of an asset in a network and figures out okay uh if it is a, if it is in the locked state then did my current sctp instance uh lock it or was it something else yeah this is a very important one it also has to do with the efficiency of of uh, of the transfer for example if you put the the lock uh, at the asset uh, at the asset level or the asset instance level it means that there is you have a kind of pessimistic locking so there is one gateway locking that specific asset instance and if something goes wrong you have to recover and but the asset is kind of reserved for the specific transfer so that's one way of implementing it's you know the pessimistic locking it may be straightforward now the other thing could be that you can have gateways that because you can have multiple gateways having access to the, the network on the specific instance competing for the transfer of the asset so this is kind of the more optimistic looking way of implementing things where you could say i mean the first that completes takes the asset instance and the others actually fail because the the instance has been already transferred now whether we, we can allow more parallelism in the processing or we allow for a specific locking and pessimistic locking it's something that has to do also with the efficiency of the implementing satp it can go both ways but if we put the lockdown at the asset instance then we definitely decide to go on a pessimistic locking approach that might eventually uh, allow less parallelism right now i take the point about the performance i think uh, but there's an ambiguity in the sense that uh, if uh, if i if i as a gateway i recover from a crash mm -hmm. and then i discover that the asset is logged uh, i think if the asset has been logged by some other satp instance and not by the satp instance that i am now in the middle of then i should just back off right mm -hmm. but if if it is uh, the uh, if it was me who logged it before crashing then it i'm duty bound to continue the satp protocol how do i distinguish these two states That's, that's there a... is, yeah, there is a part. I don't remember the which exact number in the flow, but there is a roll forward uh, mechanism. So from the moment that you know that you cross a specific step in the SATP protocol, which is the third part of the confirmation of the the commit, I believe that there you cannot do anything else but waiting for the gateways to recover. But in all the previous steps, yeah, three point six. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, and so in the uh, for all the previous steps we could eventually assign the asset instance to a different transfer and then it will just you know uh, be not a successful commit but it will be a roll back on the specific uh, asset instance and that's fine that's normal on the specific okay. transfer i mean okay thanks and thanks thomas yeah. for pointing this out brilliant thank you very much um Unless there's any more questions for Dennis today, um, so there is a question about crash recovery and the reorgs of the network. So this this specific question is, not, of course, it's not part of the asset uh, definition because the asset lives inside the network. So it's more like on the on the resilience and the recovery of the protocol. I would say I don't know if Rama you would like to uh, complement on that. So if an asset uh, is um, considered uh, transferred out and uh, it was considered the, the, uh, on, uh, from the losing uh, network and uh, now the losing network, if uh, block recovery in DLT or uh, block reorg in DLT, or let's say if we expand it to general different type of uh, ledgers or database based ledgers, they somehow come up with a state that is inconsistent with what uh, the SAPT uh, uh, SATP already uh, instance already recorded, how do we, is that considered a part of a kind of crash? Uh, because the SAT instance is not crashed, but uh, the state could be, yeah. it shows in the consistency. And let's say, or in some jurisdictions, right? There is a, <clears throat> it's not a, uh, a reward, but it's a seizure, right? Um, in a, by, by the jurisdiction authority. Um, how do we reflect that in, in, in our protocol? So I think uh, this is a yeah. fantastic discussion, and I hate to cut it off, but we're running short on time. Okay. Um, can we take that discussion to the list? It looks uh, like an excellent thing to work out maybe okay. in one of our interim meetings, uh, which I think Claire was about to talk about. Absolutely. Next Thank you. Um, I think Peter's still got his hand up, but unless it's something um, that, that's different, I would suggest we, we take that to the mailing list just in the the 
the consensus of time, um, or as uh, Mois says, in the interim meetings. So um, as a group, we've ha been having interim meetings on the first Tuesday of every month um, at 3.30 my time, uh, GMT. Is that still something that people feel would be valuable having? Obviously, we'll, we'll put a, a request out on the mailing list to confirm this, but do people still feel that having an interim meeting on the first Tuesday of every month at 3.30 p.m. E GMT is, is suitable? Um, is it that the interim meetings might need a new time or date? Um, and do we feel that we do still want to have them monthly uh, is a general question. Anybody have opinions? Uh, chat says uh, interim is useful, monthly is good. Um, plus one on that. Is there uh, any, uh, and I'll put a mailing list note out, but is there any kind of improvement on, on time or date for anyone or does the current setup work? Uh, Claire, I would suggest that considering people rotate through the working group that we might want to send out a doodle poll or something to figure out, a generic one to figure out the best time of day and week yep. Uh, yep. to do mm -hmm. it on. So, uh, Absolutely, yep. I will do that. Thank you. All right, so we are still in any other business, uh, so certainly forward progress on uh, how we're going to work. I, I would, I guess one of the other questions is, uh, we're certainly not going to meet in November because it's already passed. Um, do we want to skip December and go to January is another uh, question and take a month off from the interim meetings or are we good to go and, and want to keep going? Uh, yeah, please. Give it a second. It's it probably rebooting. Try now. Boop, boop. Yeah, yep. Okay, now it's working. Uh, it's Peter here. It's just a quick comment. Uh, I last ITF I uh, discussed with uh, Rama about some interesting use cases and uh, uh, regarding using set P for uh, practicing, you know, complex some financial instruments, something like uh, an auction, and uh, also other use cases like pay as you watch. I find that. Kind of interesting, and uh, I already have that use case written, but uh, not ready for discussion before this ITF. So maybe after the ITF, I'll send it to the mailing list for discussion. Yeah, please, That's exactly. I would I would send the, the text blocks that you think should go into the use case document, and and then the working group can decide if it looks um, cool, pro or con. And and for working group participants, please do comment when you see something you like, just because you. You like it doesn't mean don't write. <laughs> you need to you need to say you you want to support something as well that you you support its inclusion because it's a good use case. And that's true for Victor's DNS proposal too. Thanks, that's great point. Oh. All right, so, nice. Uh, Go ahead. Oh, yeah, Say that again, Claire, you were echoey. I was saying I shouldn't speak because it's echoey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're they're twiddling with all the audio at the moment. Um, I think though we are concluded is uh, where you were likely going. And so thank you everybody for coming. Uh, we'll end right on time. And um, I think that this working group is making good progress. And um, when I report to the AESG later, um, that you know, this, this group has been plugging along monthly and getting a lot done and possibly getting a draft ready for left call one year after starting the group is, is actually not common. Uh, so well done on everybody's part. Thank you very much everybody for coming. <laughs>